So the last lesson of the semester is it for differential calculus. We move on to kind of a different version of calculus, different form of calculus, which we find is very related to differential calculus. But it'll start out and it'll be kind of completely different once we come back. So this is it. Out. This is on optimization and absolute extrema. So well, we're going to start with absolute extrema first, and then we'll get to optimization. So we know how to find relative extrema, okay? Relative maxes and mins. How do we find them? It's from back in unit four, and then we had some extra problems on this. Exactly. We have to find the critical point, so we set the derivative equal to zero, or see when it's undefined, and then we have to analyze the signs around those critical points to see if we have maxes or min. Okay? So this is like review. Set this equal to zero, factor out, stuff to solve. We don't know if these are maxes or mins yet until we actually analyze around those points. If we found all of the zeros correctly, that means if we just test one point in our intervals to analyze the signs of F prime, we'll know the signs of F prime everywhere in our interval. We usually use the simplified F prime to help us see that to the right of two, all the derivatives are positive, which means my function's increasing, my original function. Between 0 and 2, all the derivatives are negative, which means my original function is decreasing from left to right. And then to the left of 0, we're increasing. So we can kind of use that to figure out that at 0, we have a local max. And at 2, we have a local min. And if I wanted to kind of graph this, I could. Now, I plug in 0, I get 5, so that's kind of easy to do to see that we have a max at the point 0, 5. And then we'd have a min. If I plugged in 2, I get 8 minus 12 plus 5, so that's 1. And then we kind of increase from there. So this would kind of be what the function looks like. So that's relative extrema. Well, absolute extrema are overall maxes and mins, not just local maxes and mins. Okay, and this first example here is a good example if I kind of just sketch it a little differently like that. We have a bunch of relative extrema here, 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 and even maybe here. However, only the smallest value on a minimum would be considered the absolute minimum. And only the largest value overall would be the absolute maximum. Well, let's look at this graph. Does this graph have an absolute maximum or minimum? Does, is this the absolute max? Is this the absolute min? No. It continues to increase as we go to the right. It continues to decrease to go to the left. Not all graphs, if we look at them for all x's, will have absolute maxes and mins. Which is why most times, if you're asked to find a max or a min, an absolute max or a min, you're going to be given an interval. So we can say no maxes, no absolute maxes, or mids. And let me talk to you about like how it changes if I give you an interval. This is kind of the same as the one before. There's no absolute maxes or mins. But I could ask you what the absolute max and min was on the interval between, say, negative 2 and 3, including the points at negative 2 and at 3. 
And you would say, okay, forget about the stuff to the left of negative two. Forget about the stuff to the right of three. We're just going to look at between them, and I can see, oh, at this relative max, at x equals negative one, that's going to be my absolute max. And at this relative min, at x equals two, that's going to be my absolute min when we're just considering this interval. Well, we can have a bunch of different intervals. Let's look at between 0 and 3. Now, my absolute min is still at 2, so that's the same. But what's my absolute max? There is not one at a relative max or min, but we would consider this point here, our end point, that is our biggest function value in this interval, which is including the point above 0. So, all of a sudden, we have more possibilities for maxes and mins. We don't have to just say you have to have a derivative equal to zero to have a max or a min. We could also have an endpoint on an interval be a max or a min. So, when you're finding absolute extrema on an interval, you got to do two things. You got to find your relative extrema. You got to check your function values for your relative extrema. And you also have to examine your endpoints. Because even if I moved this interval to be like from 0 to 1, there'd be no relative extrema. The max and the min would be on the endpoint. So let's, uh, let's do an example. Let's find the absolute extrema of this function that we examined at the top of the page. And let's examine these absolute extrema between 1 and 3. We know that if I asked you what are the absolute extrema of this function, you would say there are none. We decrease to the left of 0. We increase to the right of 2. So I'm going to give you an interval and say between 1 and 3, where are absolute maxes and mins? So step 1 is to find your relative extrema. Well, really just find your critical points. So we did that before. We found that x was equal to 0 and 2. And step 2 is to examine the function values. of your critical points and your endpoints. The biggest value you're going to get will be your absolute max, the location of your absolute max on your interval. The smallest value will be your absolute min. So immediately, I will just disregard 0. This is not in my interval. And instead, I'm just going to look at 2. 
which is my relative extrema, my critical point, or my possible relative extrema, my definite critical point. And I'll also look at one and three, which are my endpoints. So all I have to do is plug in two into my original equation, one and three, and look at the function values. Now, in the past, when we were finding relative extrema back in unit four, your book always plugged back in and found the point that's your max or your min. And I never really asked you to do that, mostly because it was just worried about the location. But now I am asking you to plug in these points to figure it out. So I get 8 minus 12 plus 5, so that's 1. We already found that. If I plug in one, I got one minus three plus five, so that's three. If I plug in three, I get twenty seven minus twenty seven plus five, that's five. So I have the function values 1, 3, and 5. That tells me when x is 2, that will be my absolute minimum of my function on my interval. Because 1 is the smallest value out of those three points. And I would say that f of 3 would be my absolute maximum. of my function on that interval. Okay? Well, we can ask you a similar question like this. Particle has a position function. <coughs> These are all supposed to be t's. x of t is equal to 2 t cubed minus 3t squared plus 2 for t greater than 0, greater than or equal to 0. Let's write an equal to sign. What is the particle furthest to the left on the interval from 0 to 2? And also we'll include the question furthest to the right. Now, if we're talking about furthest to the left, what kind of positions are we talking about if we're to the left? Yeah, negative positions are to the left. Positive positions are to the right. So if I want to see furthest to the left, I'm going to be looking for the smallest values, or I'm going to be looking for the absolute min of my function, my position function, between 0 and 2. Well, same procedure. There's just two steps. You're going to find your relative extrema, and you're going to check that against your endpoints and see which one comes up with the smallest value. That will be your absolute min.
My position at time zero is two. My position at time one is one. My position at time two is six. So this would be the location of my absolute minimum, or that's when we are furthest to the left. This would be the location of my absolute maximum on this interval, which is when we'd be furthest to the right. Okay, absolute maximum and min, take the derivative, set, the, set it equal to zero, also examine the endpoints. One more question before we move on to optimization, which is really similar to this. We have two functions, nine minus x squared and x squared minus eight x. And these two functions have a vertical distance between them at each x value. The question is, when is the vertical distance between the two functions the greatest on the interval between 0 and 4? It helps to look at this graphically. That's 9 minus x squared. x squared minus 8x will have uh, solutions of 0 and 8. So it'll probably be something like this. OK. And we're looking at between 0 and 4. So that's probably right around here. And we're saying that at each x value, so at a certain x value, we have a vertical distance. Okay, and if we move, you know, over here, maybe the distance is a little bit less than right here. Maybe over here the distance is the smallest. But we're trying to figure out at what x location is the distance between these two graphs the largest. Okay, so we need to find the absolute max on the interval between 0 and 4, but of what equation of f of x? Well, that would give me the maximum function value, but I'm trying to find the absolute max of the distance. What equation could give me the distance between those two? Would be a distance equation, but we actually, it's easier because there's no x distance. It's just a y distance. So if, like, if I knew this was a point at 3 and this was negative 2, what's the distance between them? 5. How would you figure that out? First one minus the second one, right? You want to find the distance between these two? Take the top one, subtract the bottom one. That's the distance. We'll do more of these types of uh, problems in the future, but this is a good intro to it. So the distance is just the top function minus the bottom function. Now, if I want to find the absolute maximum of that distance equation, what do I have to do? Exactly. Whenever we need to find maxes of things or mins of things, you take the derivative, you set it equal to zero. Because the max of this, whatever this looks like, it'll look something like this. This will be a location where we have a horizontal tangent. That's why derivatives set equal to zero are so powerful. It helps us find these locations easily. So 
I take the derivative, and I don't have to have distance d. I could have y or something. But if I take the derivative with respect to x, I just call that d prime. Negative 4x plus 8. Set that equal to 0. I get x equals 2. Now, that might be a maximum, but I have an interval. Maybe this is a minimum. I could actually go ahead and do the signs around 2 to know that that's a maximum. But instead, maybe I'm just going to check by finding the distance at this time 0, the distance at this time 2, and the distance at the time 4 to be sure that this is going to be the x-coordinate where the two graphs are furthest away from each other. So if I plug in 0, I get 9. If I plug in 2, I get negative 8 plus 16 plus 9. So that's 8 plus 9, 17. If I plug in 4, I get negative 32 plus 32 plus 9. That's 9. So these would be the minimum distances. At the same time, we have two absolute minimums on this interval. And this would be the location when the distance is the greatest. And the distance would be 17 units. Now, we could see that uh, graphically. Sometimes it's nice to see, but it's actually tough to see the distances being, you know, maxing out. They look similar, but it's a good question. All right, let's move into optimization. Optimization is just the same thing as what we did. We're finding maxes and mins. Okay, it's a huge thing in calculus, finding maxes and mins, okay? Because we can apply finding a max and a min to a real-world situation, and we can figure out, you know, the, the, the route that would minimize the distance from point A to point B. We could figure out what is the shape of a house with certain constraints so that the house uses the least amount of material, or what would be the shape of a can to hold a certain amount of liquid so that we use the least amount of aluminum to make that can. All of these things we can use calculus to kind of optimize a situation so that we can do things uh, most cost effectively or to make the most profit, stuff like that. So really, it's kind of like related rates problems but they're easier, okay? So keep that in mind. And the steps to solve are just similar to related rates problems. The key is you want to generate one equation using really just one variable by substituting a secondary equation into the first. You'll have to produce two equations, one that you're going to optimize, and the other, which is we'll call a secondary, which you'll use to plug in to eliminate a variable. Similar to how, during related rates problems, we found fixed relationships or fixed values that we plugged into original equations to simplify things, it's the same thing here. We will find a fixed relationship. We will use it to substitute in to make the problem easier. The easiest types of optimization problems use numbers. Let's find the two positive numbers, an x and a y, where x times y has to equal 198, and the first number plus three times the second number has to be a minimum. Okay, so there's lots of numbers that multiply together to equal 198. I want the two specific numbers where you take the first one and add three times the second one 
and that's the smallest as possible out of all the possible combinations. You're going to need two things. You're going to need an optimize, optimizing equation and your secondary equation. Your optimizing equation is the thing that you want to have be a max or a min. I want x plus 3y to be a min. Now I'm going to say that's equal to you know, like the sum or something like that. It doesn't really matter. But I'm going to star this equation because I need this to be a min. This is the equation that we will take the derivative of. Now the secondary equation is the equation that will help Simplify your optimize, uh, optimizing equation. In this case, my secondary equation, something that must always be true, is that my x value times my y value has to equal 192. Once I have this secondary equation in the optimizing, I will solve for a variable. It doesn't matter which variable I solve for. And I will substitute it into my optimizing equation. So I can maybe solve for y, and I get y is equal to 192 over x. What I can then do is take this optimizing equation and substitute in 192 over x for y. What's 192 times 3? Might as well. 6, 7, 2, thanks. 576. And now we are ready to take the derivative of this. Now we'll take the derivative with respect to whatever variable we have in there because we're going to figure out what variable will produce this optimized sum, this max or min sum. Now I don't really care that it's ds dx. I can just call it s prime in this case. And I'll get 1 plus. Now the derivative of this, this can be written as 576 times x to the negative first. So it would be negative 576 times x to the negative second. Once I have that, this is my derivative. So if I set this equal to zero, I will find the maxes and the mins of my original equation that I was asked to optimize. Set it equal to zero. Uh, subtract 1, multiply by x squared, divide by negative 1, you get 576 equals x squared. And the square root of 576 is what? Twenty four. So that's my first number. Find my second number. Use the secondary equation, something that always has to be true. 24 times my second number has to equal 192. 192 divided by 24 is 8. Surrender connect. Um, would it be plus or minus 24? Uh, yes, it would be. Good call. It would be plus or minus 24. However, what was the stipulation in our question? Yeah, you're exactly right, though. Most of the time in these optimizing questions, we'll be dealing with lengths and distances, so we'll always want positive values. Okay, so it turns out 24 and 8 are the two numbers that multiply to get 192, and 
the 24 plus 3 times the second number, 8, would give us the smallest sum possible. Okay, cool. Let's try another one. You guys try this one. So the first number plus twice the second number has to equal 100, and the product has to be a maximum. solve for any variable. I get y is 25, substitute it back in, I get x has to equal 50. So good question, should I have dy dx's here since I have y? Well we're optimizing the y's here, we're trying to figure out what y will produce a maximum product. So. I really don't care if it's a slope, which is why I'd want dy dx, right? dy dx would be the slope of the tangent. Instead, I just want to figure out what would produce the maximum point of this function. So I just take the derivative with respect to whatever variable I'm using. So in this case, what is the instantaneous change of my product with respect to my y? I figure out when that's zero, because when the instantaneous change is zero, that's when we'll have those maxes or those mins. Okay, but typically we will have kind of real world situations. And there will be a couple of these that we'll do. And then we will do uh, a distance one. And those are the types of problems that I need you to know how to do for your quizzes and your tests. So here's the situation. A gardener wants to make a rectangular enclosure using a wall of a barn as one side. He's got a 120 meters of fence for the other three sides. Find the dimensions of the fence that give the greatest area of this enclosure. So here's the situation. We got a barn. And then we have a fence. It's rectangular. What am I trying to optimize? The area. Well, what can I say the area of this enclosure is? Exactly, let's just designate two variables. We have a length, this will be the length, and a width. Well, I don't want to take the derivative as I see it. What I want to do is substitute one of those variables 
so that I just have one variable in this equation, whether it's just x's or y's. So this is where I need a secondary equation. What would be the secondary uh, equation which would come from like a constraint given to me? Beautiful. A lot of you got it. You're on top of it. 120 meters of fencing is all that I have. So that means the perimeter has to just be that. That is my secondary, my constraining equation. We would then solve for one of our variables. Doesn't matter what it is. Substitute it in before we take the derivative. Now, what we still have to remember, and a lot of people forget with these optimizing equations, is that they'll substitute this in, and then they'll simplify it, and then they'll set it equal to zero, and they'll just start solving. But we're missing a key step. Got to find the derivative. Setting this equal to zero is just telling me when my area will equal zero. I don't want that. I want when the change of my area equals zero which will tell me when my area will be at a max or a min. So write yourself a note to don't forget to take the derivative. So I get 120 minus 4x, I get x is 30. Substitute it back into my secondary. Y is 120 minus 2 times 30. Y's got to be 60. Let's try to get through two more. A manufacturer wants to design an open box having a square base and a surface area of 108 square inches. What is the maximum possible volume of the box? So let's draw an open box with a square base. If we have a square base, whatever this length is, this width has to be the same thing. It's the height that can change. So maybe I'll put this as just an H. What are we trying to maximize? Volume. What is the formula for the volume of this box? x squared h. Good. Well, that's got two variables, so that's not good. So I need a secondary equation. The fact that the surface area has to be 108 square inches, that's going to produce my second equation. So 108 has got to equal, so surface area would be the area of the bottom plus one, two, three, four sides around it, and since it's an open box, we don't have a top, so it'd be one, two, three, four XHs. Now, what's going to be easier to solve for, X or H? H, because I'd have to like factor out an X, and I don't even think it's possible to solve for, for X. So 108 minus X squared is equal to 4XH. H is equal to 108 minus X squared over 4X. So I'm done with this secondary. Now I can come back here. I get X squared times. 108 minus x squared over 4x. 
let's go ahead and simplify things. I can cancel this X and distribute the other X. Now I'm ready to take the derivative with respect to X to optimize this volume. I'm going to leave the 1 fourth out on the side. I'll have 108 minus 3X squared. To optimize, set that equal to 0 to find when that change of the volume is 0. We'll just have to worry about 108 being equal to 3X squared. 108 divided by 3 is 36. X is plus or minus 6, but we'll just deal with the positive 6 because we're dealing with length. Now, question is, what is the maximum possible volume? So I have X. I need to find the volume. So I need to find H. So we got 108 minus 36 divided by 4 times six twenty four so that's three so the volume is thirty six times three which is one oh eight just plugging in and figuring it out the key part is here. Yes. Okay. Next problem, we will set it up. I'll solve the rest of it. It's something that is a typical optimization problem. And then there will be a couple more problems on optimizing distance between a point and a function. And you need to watch that before you do your homework. So we got an open box of maximum volume is to be made from a square piece of material. I'm going to change this to be six inches on a side by cutting equal squares from the corners and turning up the side. For this picture, for this problem, you need to draw a picture. I'd like you to draw the picture in your notes just so you know what it looks like. We have a square piece of material. Each side is six inches, and we will make a box by taking corners and cutting them out and folding up the sides. Do you kind of see how this open box is made? So well, what ends up happening is we have the bottom of the box, which is here, and then the sides would be up here. The flaps would be the sides. Well, we're cutting out these boxes, these corners. We can say, since they're all equal, that these corners are X. I want to maximize the volume of this box. Well, what would be a formula for the volume of this box? Exactly. It's the length, the width, and then the height. The length would be 6 minus 2x. The width would be the same, and the height would be x. Well, this has just one equation or one variable, so we can actually just simplify this, take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and solve. I'm going to do that for you in the video. And there's a couple more problems that you need to watch as well. So watch the last, like, 10 minutes of the video. Thank you. All right, so we have our formula. It only has one variable. There's no need for a secondary equation. We are ready to kind of simplify this first and then solve. So 
that's 12, 24 x's when I square this. This is 4x squared, and this all times an x. So I get 36x minus 24x squared plus 4x cubed. Ready to take the derivative of this with respect to x? So I can find the maximum volume at the specific x, so v prime. is equal to 36 minus 48x plus 12x squared. Let's see, I can factor out a 12 plus x squared minus 4x plus 3. Then I can factor this, set this equal to 0, factor to solve x minus 3, x plus, sorry, x minus 1. So I get x equals 3 and 1. Now, it's interesting. One of them is going to end up being a max. One might be a min. Or, actually, if we think about it, if I cut out boxes here, and yes, this definitely would be a min, of 3 inches by 3 inches, my volume would be 0. So if I plug in like 3 into my original equation, I'd get 6 minus 6 squared times 3. So that's 0. So this would be the min This would therefore have to be the max, and if I plugged in 1, I get 6 minus 2 squared times 1. Uh, so that's just 16 cubic units. Inches. Okay. So that's an interesting problem. Uh, it's a typical problem seen. Let's do two more. And these deal with distances and optimizing the distance. So the question is, find the point on the graph of the function closest to the given point. So here's a function, the square root of x, and here's the point 4, 0. It's good to look at this graphically. I have a point 4, 0. Then I have the square root of x. So we have the point 1, 1, 2 root 2, 4, 2. And here's the square root of x. Okay, now there's some point here that is the closest to this point in terms of distance. Now we want to maximize or minimize distance. We have to use the distance formula. Well, let's think about the distance formula. The distance between two points is this. We got an x2 minus an x1 squared. And then we'll add a y2 minus a y1 squared. And this is just the Pythagorean theorem, just kind of manipulated so that we can find the x distance, find the y distance. Well, what's really great about this is that if I want to minimize the distance, that's the same as minimizing the square of the distance. So if I square both sides, this is going to produce the same results as this. I don't want to use this because it'll be more complicated. You have to use the chain rule to take the derivative of the big square root. Instead, let's just deal with this. Okay? So we have a point somewhere here that's an x and a y that is going to be the closest to this point for zero. 
Now here's my equation. What I'm going to try to do is start filling in the information so that I can eliminate my variables so that I can take the derivative. So let's call this my x2. So I have x minus my x1 is 4. And then over here, my y2, I have is y minus 0. Okay, now that's, that's great and all, but it still has two variables. And I know when I want to optimize, I want to eliminate one variable so that I can just take the derivative with respect to one variable and not worry about changes of things, and it'll be easy. Well, how do I eliminate something? It's actually not that bad. The key is this point. Yes, this is an x and a y, but this is not just any random y. This is a specific y that comes from my function equation. You want to find exactly what this y is. This y is actually located at the square root of x. So instead of xy, it's x root x. All of a sudden, this y can be root x. Now I have one variable. Now I can simplify this and take the derivative and figure out what point on this square root function is closest to the point 4, 0? I have x squared minus 8x plus 16 plus an x squared. So that's 2x squared minus 8x plus 16. This is simplified. I'm ready to take the derivative. So take the derivative with respect to x. I'll get d squared prime. And I'm going to figure out when that is minimized. So I'll set this equal to 0, or x minus 8. That seems right. And I solve, I get x is equal to 2. So turns out at the point 2, root 2, that'll be the closest to the point 4, 0. Cool. Just making sure everything looks good. Minus 4x minus 4x squared. 2x squared. Take the derivative. 4x minus 8. We're good. All right. Here's another question. Find the point on the graph of the function closest to the given point. We have x squared and the point 2, 1 half. So let's look at this. This might be uh, harder. Who knows? Here's the graph of x squared. It's got the point 1, 1, 2, 4. So this is 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this would be the point 2, a half right there. So there's some point, looks like on the right side of the parabola, on the parabola where we'll be closest. Uh, to this point two one half. Now let's remember the point that would be closest. This point would be an x, and then the y coordinate would be an x squared. All right. Well, let's use our distance formula, or more particularly the distance squared formula. We have the distance between the x's squared plus the distance between the y squared. Start filling in information. I'll have x minus 2 squared plus, for the y's, I'll have x squared minus a half squared. Uh, this should be fun. Let's see, after I square things, I get x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus, this would be x to the fourth. That's minus 1 half, minus 1 half, so that's minus an x squared. That's not bad, actually be plus a quarter, minus a half x minus a half x is minus 1. Okay, so x squared will go away. The d squared formula would just be x to the fourth 
minus 4x and then 4 and a quarter. Uh, that's 17 fourths. Doesn't really matter because what I have to do, and don't forget to do this, is take the derivative of this optimizing equation. So d squared prime, I get 4x cubed minus 4x, or sorry, minus 4. And I'll set this equal to 0, add 4 to both sides, divide by 4, x cubed is equal to 1 x equals just 1. So it turns out at the point 1, 1, that'll be the closest point on this function to the point 2, 1 half. Okay, that's really it for optimizing. Uh, do your homework and uh, make sure you come in with any questions that you have. Thank you.